Hey, my name is Dakota Lee and I'm an animal communicator. Thanks for clicking on this video because today I am talking about long distance animal communication. How does it work um, when I can talk to an animal that isn't in the same room with me or even on the same continent? So first I wanted to do a brush up on animal communication itself. Animal communication is an in intuitive connection I can get with an animal in which I can hear their thoughts and they can hear my thoughts and we can talk in this way. I don't need um, to physically say anything out loud, nor does the animal need to say something back to me. I don't need to understand their meows, um, and I don't even need to see their body language. Um, it doesn't rely on anything external. It really is, um, I guess the best way to say it, more of a heart-to-heart -heart connection or a mind-to-mind -mind connection. And uh, it's, it's, it's pretty out there, but it's also very real. And so one thing that I can do with this animal communication, um, I don't even have to be in the same room as the animal. All I need to connect is just a photo. It's just a photo. And in a lot of cases, I can connect with just a name and the species. But I like to have clients, you know, send me or text me or email me uh, pictures of their, their animal they want me to connect with. And the connection is just as strong as if I were in person with them. So I wanted to share a few stories of animal communication um, in long distance and how it works. So I had a friend uh, with a cat named Bliss and I was in North Carolina in the United States and my friend was in Florida. Well, my friend called me, her cat was acting weird, Bliss was acting strange, she wanted me to check in on her. So I did. Uh, my client was on the phone with me and I had connected with Bliss in the past so it's almost like it's almost like I've got like a contacts list in my head and so I'm able to just okay Bliss's number and and pull up her unique frequency and that's what I use to hone in on you know who she is to talk to her well I'd connected with her before so I pulled it up and, and connected and that day in particular um, I came in a little too strong so my <laughs> my friend was on the phone with me and I connected with Bliss and all of a sudden I feel and kind of hear Bliss go ah! <laughs> and I I say quietly to my friend I think I scared her and my friend goes mm-hmm because in that exact moment uh, Bliss had been half sleeping on the porch while her eyes shot open and she jumped three feet in the air so yeah she felt me come in <laughs> so uh, after we got over that moment I was able to ask Bliss has something been bothering you lately and she repeated two things to me she wanted to know why all the doors were closed and she wanted to know uh, you know why doesn't she want me those two phrases so uh, through working with my friend, we came to realize that there was a roommate that um, was closing the doors because she didn't want Bliss in her room. Well, I asked Bliss, what do you think about this, about this roommate, and why do you think that this could be happening? And Bliss tells me, well, whenever she's around me for a while, after a few minutes, I start to see her go, you know, like this and, and, and itch. Um, so maybe she's trying to avoid that feeling. And I asked my friend, is your roommate allergic to cats? And sure enough, the roommate was allergic to cats. And so um, I couldn't have known these things, you know, um, being being long distance. Um, but the animal was telling me them. And so that's how we really piece these together. And so I was able to tell Bliss, well, I have good news, honey. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, it's just your fur, <laughs> which is, it's not, it doesn't have to do with your heart or who you are. Um, and that's why the doors are closed and that's why um, she doesn't the roommate doesn't seem to want you and so Bliss's attitude what my friend told me really dramatically changed after that she seemed to return to her old um, happy confident self so now I have another story of long distance so so that first one uh, we were states apart from each other well this one we we're an ocean apart from each other I have a client who lives in Spain she's a very high-level horseback rider and her horses are in Spain as well and uh, one time she she called me um, and she wanted me to just ask her horse where the pain was the vet had checked this horse he had really weird symptoms and they just couldn't figure out where it was so she called me so I talked to him um, and I had his picture and so I was able to, you know, almost it's almost like I focus on the picture to find that frequency and then it kind of goes to actually wherever the animal is. Um, and suddenly we're, we're talking. So I connected with him and he very quickly showed me exactly where the pain was. He said um, it was his vertebrae in his neck, um, at the base of his neck, kind of where between his withers or between, it would be between our shoulder blades, uh, at least for on a horse how that would translate. Uh, those vertebrae are, had shifted and it was causing all sorts of strange symptoms because his nerves had shifted as well and some weird things were pressing on his nerves. 
Well, I um, was able to tell my client this, and she uh, and her horse went back to the vet the next day to get him checked again. They checked that exact spot, and that's exactly what was happening. There was inflammation between the vertebrae, and it had caused those vertebrae to shift. And so he was having all these weird pain signals that were very hard to diagnose. But because they were able to ask me, and I was able to ask him, we could get some real clarity. Um, and. And so it can be very, very powerful, you know, sometimes behaviorally, like with Bliss, helping her understand, and sometimes medically, uh, figuring out what's going on. Um, and, you know, that was across an ocean, but it, it didn't matter. That's, that's animal communication. It's really, really amazing. So um, after sharing those stories, and those are just a few that I pulled off the top of my head, I now want to describe my theory behind animal communication and how it works. So to do that, I kind of have to, and this is through trial and error. Um, I wasn't really trained, or well, I was trained the hard way. I just kept trying it um, until it worked. Um, I've kind of developed a system of thinking on it, and I'm going to share that now. So. The way I see it, animals and people both have two sides to their brain. There's the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. And uh, for humans especially, there's a very strong barrier between them. Animals, it's kind of blurred. Uh, so it's easy for them to go back and forth between the two. Well, um, in order to communicate with animals, I had to be able to, at will, dip into the subconscious part of my brain, which was very hard to do, and I'll tell you why. Um, and this, this happens whether you communicate with animals or not. Um, when you feel nervous, um, you know, people say like they put a wall up. Well, that's actually what's going on. When I felt nervous, and this would happen a lot when I was starting to communicate with animals because I felt nervous, I just, I wanted to get it right, I wanted to hear it right, am I going to hear it right today? I would put a wall up between my conscious and subconscious, and I didn't even know it, but I would block myself from being able to communicate. And that became, conquering that was the hardest thing I had to do in animal communication, was learning how to drop that wall at will, relax it no matter what's going on with me. Um, because otherwise I couldn't talk to them, I would be locked in my own mind. And so, um, you know, through trying to figure that out, I learned some more things about the, the conscious and the subconscious. So the conscious mind, it's it's um, finite, um, it's logical, and, and you can kind of, you can even train your conscious mind if you want to, you can organize it. Um, and the subconscious mind is completely, completely opposite from that. Um, the subconscious mind, it, it's kind of like the ocean, it seems to go on forever. As far as I know, it does go on forever. And uh, it's wild, there's no taming it. Um, and there's no walls in it either. And so with that being said, what I learned when I was finally able to drop that wall between my two brains, basically, um, I began to learn that my there, there are no walls in the subconscious mind. And so think about this. Um, if the subconscious mind is infinite, um, and as far as I know, it seems infinite, then there can only be one of them. And if there's only one of them, um, then that means that all of us, um, animals and people, are living in the same subconscious space. And there's no walls in the subconscious anyway stopping us from connecting and reaching out to each other. And that is why I can do what I can do. Um, and so, you know, I didn't need to, um, I could have, you know, kept this knowledge locked away and, um, you know, never really reached out um, to my subconscious, but I decided, you know what, it's worth it. I'm going to go be vulnerable. I'm going to go out there and, and, and meet others um, and, and talk to them soul to soul and see what comes back, and it's been extremely rewarding. And so when I was able to get into the subconscious, um, it's almost like I have a very good ability to find a frequency literally anywhere in the world, pick up on that, hone in, and within a second, usually, um, I can meet them and start a conversation. And it uh, doesn't matter what species, doesn't matter what animal, big or small, um, and it's, well, it's cool. It's very cool. So, whew, as in short of time as that I could, I have uh, described animal communication. There's, of course, so much more to it, but this is um, kind of a base theory on long-distance animal communication and why it works. So thanks for listening. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it because I hope I enjoyed making it. Uh, and yeah, have a great one. I'll see you on the next video. Bye.